you. May be seated. Honourable members, uh, welcome today, and the usual request stand of adhering to the general protocols for combating the pandemic and stopping its spread by our conduct. The first motion on the order paper is a motion in the name of the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Uh, Chief Whip. Talk to us. Honorable Deputy Speaker, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to this August House, all honorable members. Honorable Speaker, today I rise to table the motion that this House notes with deep sadness the passing of the African National Congress Member of Parliament and former President of Umkonde Wesizwe Military Veterans Association, known as MKMVA. Mr. KB, Emmanuel Ramoutwana Mapazwe, who passed on on the 31st of August 2021. This House to further note that Mr. Mapazwe became a Member of Parliament in 2014 and at the time of passing, he was a whip responsible for sport, arts, and culture. This house, to remember that he previously served in the Portfolio Committee of Police as a whip of the study group and was a former Deputy Minister of Defense and Military Veterans from 2014 to 2019. This house, to further recall, that his long political history includes training as a political soldier of Umkonto Wesizwe in Uganda, which he also went to Angola. The House to further recall that he is a former member of COSAS, Congress of South African Students, former member of so SOICO, Soweto Youth Congress, as well as former member of SAICO, South African Youth Congress. It's hard to believe that his passing has robbed the country of a dedicated lawyer, of a dedicated, loyal, and patriotic freedom fighter, a robust and fearless legislator, and a capable leader. The family of Mr. Comrade Mapazwe, the bishop sitting over there, Melrado, the daughter. Ishonolo, Tabiso, Newo, and Victoria, may this house convey its heartfelt condolences to this family and say, Musia, Mutubazi, Robale, Kahozo, I so move. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, we now invite Honorable A.G. Whitfield. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I would like to convey our heartfelt condolences to the FEP. Uh, just a moment, Honorable Whitfield. Honorable members, and others, please switch off your microphones. Uh, just switch off your microphones, uh, please, and others. Just make sure that yours is off as well, uh, so that we don't disrupt the process. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Honorable Whitfield. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I would like to convey our heartfelt condolences to the family, friends, and colleagues of the late Honorable Kenny Mapatswe. Honorable Mapatswe and I arrived in Parliament at the same time in 2014, and ultimately served together for the past two and a half years on the Portfolio Committee on Police. Honorable Mapatswe served as whip of the committee, and from time to time, he stood in for the chairperson and led deliberations of the committee. 
during our time together on the committee, we disagreed vehemently with each other on the issues about which we felt strongly. Our engagements, however, never descended into personal attacks, no matter the nature of our disagreement. And this, I believe, must be his legacy to all of us in this House. We in this House all need to rise above the petty politics of personality and challenge ourselves to develop a more responsible, more mature approach to politics based on the issues that matter to our nation. We wish his family, friends, and colleagues in the African National Congress the courage to overcome this difficult time. May his soul rest in peace. Uh, thank you. Uh, EFF. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. When we first heard about the passing of Comrade Mapadwe, we called each other asking ourselves, which KP Mapadwe? Because we couldn't believe. And there's only one KP Mapadwe in the country. And we had to sober up a bit and say, it is the one that we know. The passing of Comrade Mapadwe came as a shock and dismay to many of us. This may because he could not complete his mission of economic freedom for all in his lifetime. To Mayor Mama Patsu, Mel Rato, and the kids, Basutu, how they let in about a PP, Riri PP, Haswena Fela, Rilalue. To the kids, you had a remarkable husband. To you, Mayor, you had a remarkable husband and a father to your kids. We thank you for allowing us to be led by a determined soldier and a very principled cadre who was prepared to be killed for his convictions. To his kids, we sincerely apologize for not having enough time and moments with a well-deserved father like your dad. He became the father of all South African children through his deeds. He fought for equality for all South African children through his deeds. He fought for equality to the hilt. All of us here, sitting here, in this parliament, on visual, and on visual, we are here in this parliament that was designed for whites only. We are sitting on benches that were meant for whites only. P.W. Bota, Dietleck, Tony Leon, Helen Sussman, H.F. Fervut, just to name the few who passed legislation in this house to oppress, murder, and expropriate the indigenous people learned without compensation. Can you just, Chair, defend me from these people? <laughs> Comrade Kebe did not agree to that. He joined the military wing Mokondo with Suze, whilst others were taken to the parks to enjoy life. He joined Mokondo with Suze to dethrone an unjust regime. The irony is that he succeeded against all odds and eventually worked in this parliament to strive to bring about equality. Comrade Kevin bemoaned the slow pace of addressing the needs of military veterans. Homelessness, unemployment, and rape and poverty befell his former comrade in struggle in his term and lifetime in government. His life in exile, Uganda, and Soviet, Soviet Union was a sacrifice to, use, to his youthfulness his plans and career. He never enjoyed the life of a child with his parents. He never showed regrets to the path he chose. Let, his, let him rest in peace. The struggle continues. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Majosi. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. The IFP is saddened by the death of Honorable KB Emmanuel Ramoduana Mapatwe, who served as the Deputy Minister of Defense for the Republic of South Africa from 2014 to 2019. Honorable Mapatwe was serving in the Portfolio Committee on Sports, Arts and Culture and Police at the time of his passing. The IFP values the contribution made by Honorable Mapatwe in the fight against apartheid. His dedication in the liberation of South Africa will always be remembered. We appreciate his efforts in pursuing the causes of war veterans in the country. The first encounter with Honorable Mapadwe was within the Portfolio Committee on Police. 
we did not meet as opposition parties, but he became a father figure. I later found out that we came from the same township. He was from Fulo and I'm from White City. We then continuously called ourselves Abumkai. The welcome I received from Honorable Mapatwe during his tenure as whip of the majority party in the committee was amazing. And he was always followed, he, he has always followed up whenever I had not attended the committee meeting to find out if I am okay and what has what has made me not to attend the meeting. We have not only lost a member in parliament, but he was my MKI. The IFP extends its deepest condolences to Honorable Mapazwa's family, colleagues, and his political organization. His death has left a void in the peace and security cluster, as well as the portfolio committees he served. Our thoughts are always with the people of South Africa to whom he served diligently in his time. This is particularly a difficult time and painful time for his family, and we wish them courage and strength to bear his ir ir irreparable loss. May all those who grieve this untimely loss be comforted, and may Honorable Mapatwe rest in eternal peace. I thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Chief, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Akbar uh, professors. Honorable Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Freedom Front Plus, I would like to convey our heartfelt condolences with the family, friends, and colleagues of Mr. Mapatswe. Mr. Mapatswe was dedicated, was a dedicated member of his political party. He fought for what he believed in and he dedicated his life to public Although we differed respect, may his family find peace after his sudden and untimely passing, and may his soul rest in eternal peace. I thank you. Honorable Tring. Honorable Tring. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the President of the ACDP, the Honorable Reverend Dr. Kenneth Meshwe, our leadership and members of the ACDP, I would like to extend our heartfelt condolences to the family of the Honorable Mapatswe. It cannot be argued that the Honorable Mapatswe had an illustrious political career, holding many important portfolios. He was a former member of the Congress of South African Students, Soweto Youth Congress, and the South African Youth Congress. And during his tenure at National Parliament, he served as the Deputy Minister of Defense and Military Veterans from 2014 to the year 2019. He also served in the Portfolio Committees on Sports, Arts and Culture and Police, as well as one of the whips for the majority party. The Honorable Mapatswe dedicated his life to fight for social justice, human rights, and above all, for the liberation of all South Africans from the brutality of apartheid. Under his political direction, the MKMVA became an integral component of the ruling party. Known as a humble leader, we in the African Christian Democratic Party pray that this unique and scarce character trait of humility becomes transferred as a trait to be emulated and admired within all political parties and taken up by the respective leadership. In conclusion, allow me to comfort the family and his colleagues in the ruling party with these words. In Psalms 34 verses 18, the word of God says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And in Psalms 147 verses three, it says, our God is the one who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I pray for the family especially that your brokenheartedness and your wounds will be healed and bound by our Lord and Savior. 
I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Long uh, health of the play, Kwanko. Honorable Kwanko. ATM. Uh, Honorable August from Good. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of Good and on behalf of our leader, Patricia De Lowe, I would like to extend our deepest condolences to the late MK veteran. We further convey our, our heartfelt condolences to the Mapatsu family. May his soul rest in everlasting peace, knowing that his role in building our country's future will never be forgotten. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. AIC, not President, uh, PAC. Deputy Speaker, I think you missed out NFP. Uh, I did miss Honorable Sheikh Imam. Please speak. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, at the very outset, allow me to apologize that I was not available in Cape Town. I had to fly back urgently and I could not meet the family members of the deceased. Uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker, Comrade Emmanuel uh, Kebi Mapatso, as he was referred to, was the Deputy Minister of Defense from 2014 to 2019, was also a trained political soldier of the front where we seized him which clearly indicates the role that he would have played, the sacrifices he would have made in his lifetime so that we could be liberated and have a free South Africa today. Allow me to salute him for the role that he had played so that we could be where we are today. He was a former member of COSAS and many other institutions. Under his political direction, the MKMBA became an integral component of the ANC and for the first time, the association was in the central agenda of the ANC's political framework with the achievement of progressive resolutions. Now, I remember him very clearly, Honorable Deputy Speaker, uh, as I'm a member of the Portfolio Committee on Police and his commitments and, and, and his engagement and some of the questions that he used to pose, particularly uh, to the South African police services, I think, it is said indeed that just when he was then promoted to the chief work in the arts and culture committee, we had to lose our comrade, uh, uh, comrade Papatsu. To his family, friends, colleagues, you have lost a friend, a father, a brother, but more importantly, South Africans have lost an ideal, a hero, somebody who has served you and liberated you. On behalf of the National Freedom Party, we extend our condolence to all of you family, friends, colleagues, the African National Congress, and South Africans at large at such a great loss. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Jumat Peterson, the chairperson of the Committee on Police. Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Chief Whip, members of Parliament, the Mapatse family, Dume Lang, Lebome, Lebore. But today we pause to remember an extraordinary member of this assembly. We come here to salute the legacy of a person who we knew as Kebi Mapatswe, member of the African National Congress, member of parliament, chief uh, and whip of the African National Congress in the police portfolio committee. He was a father, a husband, an uncle, and a comrade to many. He joined the fifth parliament in 2009 and became the deputy minister of defense in 2014. He served courageously. I want to say that he was more than a comrade that one could depend on. I want to say that I stand here before you to pay tribute to a dear colleague, a dear friend, and a dear comrade. I learned so much from Comrade Kebi during our time together in the structures of our liberation movement and our portfolio committee. He had a wisdom that was not easily earned. 
it was clear that he thought deeply about the problems we addressed before he would utter a word. He was a careful listener and did not offer to say anything before he really understood the situation and he was asked to comment on. Let me say that there were many situations where we became impatient with each other, but his patience with me always won over my impatience with him. We agreed that he has a sense of passion and he had a sense of reason. And the juxtaposition be between his passion and reason, many often, more often than not, caused us to differ with one another. But even though we differed in many aspects, I admired him as a person, a father, a human being, and a very loyal soldier. Let us, in honor of him, mobilize all the positive factors that can be mobilized. Let us, in, in honor of him, pull together with strength in our collective endeavors to further our freedom agenda. Let us have much more strength as possible as a collective as we will lead us, Honorable Chief Whip. That unity behind the goal of national renewal and rebuilding our society and our institutions is a hallmark that distinguishes the ANC from other political parties. It is our courage to undertake self-correction. It is so vital and vibrant despite having uh, to undergo so many trials and tribulations in this effort. We need to respond appropriately to the risks and tests of diff different historical periods. Let us demonstrate a greater political awareness because our journey which Comrade Kebi started for self-freedom and freedom of our country through our liberation movement is a never-ending journey. It has not yet, yet ended. We must tighten our party and our organization and our country's organizational systems and work harder to train high caliber political officials who have both the moral integrity and the professional competence to remain committed to this house's fundamental constitutional principles. Let us have people in our committees with conduct which upholds integrity, combats corruption, and roots out any elements that would harm our beloved country. During the time of the uh, pandemic, I had long conversations with Comrade Kebi. I was really, I had to pause and serve uh, an understanding and believe that there was such a strong understanding of how we would uphold and develop our country after this pandemic. His fight has not ended. Instead, for us, there remains this zero-sum games. We will oppose whatever power politics there needs to be and will be in our interaction with one another, even in the committee. Because of Comrade Kebi, we will uphold justice and a social justice system which centers around the portfolio of committee of police and will not be intimidated by forces of gender-based violence or any threats of their violence against our nation and against our women. As a portfolio committee which we have lead, we lead as an ANC, we will demonstrate stronger vigilance and always be prepared for the potential dangers which face our hard-won freedom. We must be both brave and adept in carrying out our struggle wherever we are in this parliament. As I said, Comrade Kebi was a person of passion and a person of reason. To his family, may I say, let his passion live on. Let him rest in his passion, and may he rise in the reason which he sought so harshly for. I thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. I thank you, comrades. Thank you, Honorable Member. That concludes the speaker's list on this matter. I take it there are no objections to the motion being adopted. No objections. Will members please rise to observe a moment of silence in memory of Mr. E.R.K. Mapazwe.
please be seated. Uh, uh, on behalf of the rest of the presiding officers, we associate ourselves with the motion. The condolences of the house will be conveyed to the Mapazwe family. The second motion on the order paper is also in the name of the Chief Whip of the Majority Party, Honorable Machodina. Engosi Kakulu Segela Somlomo Windu Yoki Nuisom Teto. The Pagama Apa and Sima Nogazisa Galum Panga Sukumbula Yonam Flange. Deep sadness of the passing on of the African National Congress MP and a deputy minister who was a deputy minister in the presidency for women, youth, and persons with disabilities. Professor Shengiwe Buhle Mkize, who passed on on the 16th of September 2021. This house to acknowledge that her untimely passing has robbed us all of a selfless patriot, a well-rounded cadre, and an experienced global citizen with vast experience in civil society struggles and a passionate defender of human rights with a commitment to improving the quality of life, especially for women, children, and persons with disabilities. This house to further note and acknowledge that Professor Mkize became a member of parliament in 2009 and was appointed as a deputy minister of correctional services in May 2009 to June 2012. This house to further remember that she served in parliament as a member of the portfolio committee on basic education and international relations as well as international relations and cooperation and served as a chairperson of the portfolio committee on communications. The House will recognize that her illustrious career also saw her occupying positions of being a deputy minister of higher education and training from 2010 to 2012 in June. Deputy minister of, Environment, of economic affairs or economic development from 2012 until April 2014. As a Deputy Minister of Telecommunication and Postal Services from 2014 until March 2017. As a Minister of Home Affairs from March 2017 until October 2017. As a Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Training from October 2017 to February 2018. This House to further recognize that before coming to Parliament, Professor Mkize was the ambassador of South Africa in Netherlands from 2005 until 2009, where she played a very critical role as a chairperson of the Executive Council of the Organization for the Prohibition of chemical weapons. This house to recall that she also played a critical role in the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where she served as a commissioner and the chairperson of Repatriation and Rehabilitation Committee from 1998 to 2003. The house to further note and recalls that Professor Mkize worked at the University of Natal with detainees and offered trauma counseling to political survivors. This house to realize that she was a formidable leader who served with courage, dignity, and respect. To the house, this house to convey to the family our heartfelt sympathies to her family, the husband seated over there would pet, what is your philosophy of life? To the daughter, Londi, Figile, Zinzi, Lalaka Kuhle, Sialuza, Majiane, Doda, Wena Buso Ungene, Wapelela, Wakabazela, Koma Vovo, Siabulela. Honorable members, uh, 
Let's thank the Chief Whip, and then before we proceed, uh, now that uh, the families have been introduced, please join us in welcoming the two families, the Mapatwe and Kize families in the gallery. Welcome. We will now invite the first speaker on the list, Honorable Mpiti. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I rise to support the motion and to join the rest of the nation in sending our deepest condolences to the family, friends, and colleagues of Deputy Minister and the Presidency for Women, Youth, and Persons with Dis Disabilities, Professor Hlingiwen Kiza who sadly passed away on the 16th September 2021. My first encounter with Professor Mkize was in 2011, while still a student. She was humble, down to earth and strong-willed. We were at the IPSA Trilateral Conference and she was delivering a keynote address. I felt comfortable to go up to her and ask her about a range of issues that I didn't agree with her on. She did not dismiss me nor ignore me, but she engaged me. I still have the picture we took together and I wanted to show her and ask her if she remembered the day. Sadly, I never got the chance to show her. What I do know is that Deputy Minister Mkize will be remembered for her dedication to her work, including her visible concern for the plight and rights of persons with disabilities. Deputy Minister Mkize remained very passionate about the rights of persons with disabilities and was very instrumental in the proposed disability rights framework and the disability bill before parliament today. She maintained an excellent rapport with organizations representing people with disabilities. She played an exceedingly important role in overcoming the obstacles usually encountered by persons with disabilities in our country. She enjoyed the championing of human rights, especially for persons with disabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Deputy Minister has always advocated for the rights of persons with disabilities, showing understanding and solutions to whatever issues came to her attention. The loss of Professor Mkize is a national loss across many sectors in our nation. She was a distinguished gender activist, human rights activist, and an academic. She applied these extraordinary achievements unselfishly with great humility to serve her country with honor. To her family, her husband, her daughters, we pray for healing and strength and unity. And Professor Mkize, we will never forget you and we will never forget your commitment to South Africa. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Um, Honorable Sonti. Akshaya. Kibonge, mm. Deputy Speaker. Uh, condolences to Deputy Minister Klingwe Mkizen. Chairperson, on behalf of the EFF, I would like to send our deep condolences to the family, friends, and comrades of the late Deputy Minister Klingwe Mkize. Deputy Minister Mkize was an absolutely phenomenal individual who dedicated her life to the freedom of African people. In particular, she had genuine passion for the development of young people and the care for the disabled and the elderly. As early as 1995, she founded and became a trustee of the Children and Violence Trust which focused on the well-being of children and tried to insulate children from violence. Her training on soci sociology and social work gave her a broad perspective of the issues facing society, particularly women, children, and those with disabilities. Her unflinching commitment to the, to the well-being of others in heart to find these days among the political elite. South Africa was truly blessed to have a leader like her. This parliament was blessed to have her gracing his, this house with her present. May her soul rest in perfect peace and may her family be comforted. Siabulela. 
Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable MD Sengwa. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm sorry. It is with a deep sadness that the Inkata Freedom Party heard of the death of Honorable Professor Mkese. I wish to extend on behalf of the His Excellent Prince Mango Suturutiles, the President in Meritus of the IFP and founder of the IFP and leader of the caucus in parliament. Uguzuelana nomde ni na leli parliament gugula shege loa. Ilese si shabashegi na lo na lo mtuga zowa makoti wawa mkise obe imise tumsebenzi gugtepa. Uma gukulunywa guguti gupo na u extra mind that is Professor Mkese. In her role as a deputy minister of women, youth, and person with disability, Sitemege Olwen 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 Olunge Tiwan Tuana Umyango Uva Lueng Shama Wugi Sino Chepesu Negeti Naumamdab Oifuna into Ifunela Abuze Namunya Namunya Zan Buze Nani Uvutinina Niabuza in Lup. What to my born professor would go nagel, Uzo Shongomoyo Pansy? Oi, Miss Ellie at his fellow niggers were old to you, Solom Shangan. Galelo Lang, who your figure is Miss Ellie Gwenzil, in Dombazan as a Mashabatinigaleo. Lay at Lebe Lapa as a lacon in Cosiake in Cosia Prince. Mango so to tell is lie is a law corner. What all a mazol when you tell a no longer being called as a much of a team in her service to our beautiful country in evidence is a long commitment in the fight for justice and quality for all South Africans before her appointment as a deputy minister in women, youth, person with disability. She also serves in various departments with dedication and commitment. In passing off, Professor Eze is a stark reminder that service is humble work. And our work as a parliamentarian should be led by passion and dedication. May we honor the life of Professor Mkese in our daily work by working together to uplift our country and ensure better future to, for all in South Africa. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lalani ngema ba besi nifunda mahubo one twenty one kagamsela meshwami ezintabin may he soul rest in peace thank you. Uh, I know this is a sad moment. Honourable members, comply with time. Uh, Honourable Tlengwa, comply. Uh, comply. Uh, okay. I'm sorry about. Honorable Briet. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Minister Mkize was a fierce woman that prioritized her education and used it to her advantage to better serve her community. Her career has been that of a mother, an academic, and a politician, and has through the years amounted to quite a list of highlights. After completing her BA degree in psychology, social work, and sociology at the University of Zululand, DM Professor Mkise furthered her studies with a BA Honours in Psychology and also a Master's in Clinical Psychology from the University of Natal. 
She was a senior lecturer and research advocate and a founding member and trustee of the Children and Violence Trust. She was a board member, commissioner, and chairperson. Diem Kize has been an ambassador, had a short stint as deputy minister of correctional services and DM of telecommunications and postal services. Prof Makize also previously served as the Minister of Higher Education and Training after a brief stint as Minister of Home Affairs. To me, she is, however, best known as Prof Klingiwe <laughs> Mkize, the Deputy Minister in the Presidency for Women, Youth and People with Disabilities, the right-hand woman of Minister, Minister Maite. Ma'am, you were a fierce opponent, a feminist and a protector of the rights of women and children. To the African National Congress, we are sorry for your loss. Losing a colleague is never easy. To the family you leave behind, DM, our greatest condolences. You are in our prayers. When the loss is overwhelming, please remember Psalm 34, verse 18, and Psalm 147, verse 3. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed, and he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. May her soul rest in eternal peace. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Sukers, ACDP. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the ACDP wish to extend our sincere condolences to the family of the late Honorable Deputy Minister, Professor Tlengwe Butlem Kize. As a young African woman and a mother, mother of daughters, it is my privilege to celebrate the homegoing of Professor Tlengwe Mkize. The world is not our home. We are pilgrims on a journey passing through to our forever home. There is the hymnal written in the 1800s and it reads, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. For them who depart this life, having found the life giver and savior Jesus Christ, death is the graduation ceremony that leads to our eternal reward. Professor Tlengiwe in her academic career is the seed that falls from the acorn tree that is Charlotte Matleke. They serve to a generation of women as torchbearers, a testimony of the brilliance of mind and the depth of character that we possess as African women of the soil. The depth of potential that resides within us when fully realized, stands out and changes the lives around us. It is my loss for not having known her, but certainly the privilege of the African National Congress women to have known her and to call her part of their own. Every fight that we fight on behalf of each and every woman is so that more women of academic and political distinction may rise and take their place. The life of Professor Tlengiwe Butlem Kize stands as a witness to that. Ambakatle. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Kwankwa. ATM. Honorable August. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the good leader, Minister Patricia DeLong, and behalf of good, we would like to extend our deepest condolences to the late Deputy Minister Mkhizi. We further convey our con heartfelt condolences to the Mkhizi family. May her soul rest in everlasting peace, knowing that the role in building our country's future will never be forgotten. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable CBC of the NFP. Thank you, Mom. We'll take this, uh, Deputy Speaker, if it's okay with you. It is okay. Go ahead, and that. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Comrade Slengiwe Mkize was the Deputy Minister in the Presidency for Women, Youth, and People with Disabilities. Now, Honorable Deputy Speaker, if you look at her resume, Professor Mkize held a BA degree in psychology, social work, and sociology, the University of Zulu, and BA honors in psychology 
and a master's in clinical psychology from the University of Natal. She was a senior lecturer and researcher at Pitts from 1993 until 1995. She was a board member of the South African Prison Organization for Human Rights from 1994 to 1995, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and chairperson of the Reparations and Rehabilitation Committee. Now, pro prior to appointment, of course, we do know that Professor Mkise was an ambassador to Netherlands. It is as a result of her qualifications, her commitment, and passion on matters to do with women, children, and those with disabilities that, of course, the president has appointed her to the position of the deputy minister. She is indeed a great loss currently with the struggle that we have in terms of gender-based violence in this country. Indeed, a great loss to the family, to the friends, to our colleagues, the African National Congress and the South African public at large. On behalf of the National Freedom Party, I extend our condolences to the family, friends, colleagues and the African National Congress. May her soul rest in peace. Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. We will talk to you about your image there. Uh, I assume that AIC and PIC are still not here. If that's okay, we'll move on to ask the Honorable the Minister and the Presidency for Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. Honorable House Chairperson, mm -hmm. Honorable uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, thank you. So, uh, Honorable uh, Chief Whip and Honorable Members, I join other Honorable Members who spoke uh, before me in celebrating the lives and memories of our departed colleagues and comrades. Comrade Kebi Mapatu and Lengue Bote Mkize. Their passing is a great loss to this August House, our movement, the African National Congress, our government, and to our nation at large. While I worked with both Comrades Kebi and Comrades Lengi in various structures in our government and movement, allow me to limit my remarks to paying tribute to the life, memory, and legacy of Professor Mkize, whom I worked with closely in the Department of Women, Youth, and Persons with Disabilities. Respected Deputy Speaker, just over two months ago, Sengiwe passed. Since her passing, yet the pain and sorrow of her departure remains fresh. In my mind, I guess, in many minds of many of our comrades in this house. For me, I always, as I said in one other occasion, look at her husband and her children and think, what do they think? And the husband has an answer of his philosophy of life. And I'm sure the children also has something else to remember about their beloved mother, Bootle. I personally 
have lost a colleague, a comrade, and a big sister. On many occasions, I depended on Professor Mkize in the execution of our political mandate as the executive uh, members responsible for the Department of Women, Youth, and Persons with Disabilities. The responsibility and task of running and leading this department with a complex mandate for three important sectors of women, youth, and persons with disabilities uh, was never easy. But with the support, expertise, and experience of Deputy Minister Nkize, I can confidently argue that it was doable. Professor Mkize devoted her personal and her family time to the work of her beloved people, community, her movement, and ANC, and our government. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to work with her in various capacities in government, in diplomacy, as I'm also a former uh, ambassador, and, with the, uh, and within the ANC structure. She had had a fine political mind and a true commitment to public uh, service. Over the past uh, couple of uh, years, since our assignment to the Department of Women, Youth, and Persons with Disabilities, I have witnessed her passion for the empowerment of our people and the, at other end to social injustice. Professor Mkiza was particularly driven by the need to empower and capacitate women with vulnerable groups within vulnerable groups. She passionately spoke of the need for the voices of the youth, especially young women in all decision-making processes. Professor Mkiza was a humanitarian at heart. With a clinical psychology background and serving as a commissioner at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, her unwavering spirit to understand the human being and internalize the pain we suffer due to subjugation has remained with me through the years as I learned from her the experience she went through. This parliament has lost a trailblazer, a humanitarian at the year in which we're celebrating Charlotte Matreke, Manya Matreke, another a trailblazer, and a leader who, has not, who was not afraid to take a stand against injustices. She will be remembered amongst her many other achievements for being a critical thinker and an intellectual of note who never allowed to be silenced when she had a strong point to make. I am devastated at the loss as, a, as I relied on her support, counseling, guidance, sisterhood in the work we did in this portfolio of uh, looking after women and persons with disabilities. I've lost a sister, a comrade, and a dear colleague at a crucial time where the, her size and knowledge were much needed. Beyond government, uh, beyond government work, I also witnessed Professor Mkiza's contribution strengthening our movement, the INC, 
We serve together in several... Honorable several... Minister, I'm afraid your time has expired. Oh. Uh, you must always look at your right, the, your left. The red signifies to... time has gone, ma'am. I can't add any Thank more. You. you now have had more than a minute. Thank I'm afraid. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, uh, Chair. I would say, Urobale Kahoto, Sesuaka. Urobale. Thank you very much. Honorable members, that concludes the speaker's list on this matter. And I take no objections to the motion being adopted. Um, uh, please switch off, honorable members. Uh, will members please write memory of Professor Mkise, Deputy Minister of Women, Youth, Persons with Disabilities. Thank you. Please be seated. Honorable members, like the previous motion, on behalf of the presiding officers, we associate ourselves with the motion. The condolences of the House will be conveyed to the Mkise family. The secretary will read the first order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Social Development on third quarter performance and expenditure report for 2020-2021 of Department of South African Social Security Agency and National Development Agency. And I'll call upon the Honorable N.Q. Mvana to introduce the report. Chair, let me go straight to overall financial performance and non-financial performance for third quarter of 2021. The report deals with compensation of employees, uh, which had an expenditure of... Honorable <laughs> Elvis Siwela, please switch off your microphone. And all of you members, please just make sure and check to confirm you are on mute. Please, it's disruptive. Okay. Okay, uh, Chairs, uh, Deputy Speaker, let me again inform the House that SASA for the current financial year was 7,718,421. The actual expenditure for the third quarter was 5,305,623. That is 69%. When you compare it with the second quarter, which was 3,372,186, and you see that it's 44%. The expenditure of agents was reported as follows. Uh, I'll just men make mention of the, the headings, the compensation of employees, goods and services, bank charges, advertisement and marketing, communication, consultants, outsource services. I'll just mention, but not few. Deputy Speaker, I will go straight to the performance information by the programs. We do have program one on SASA, which uh, uh, achieved 94%. And we do have program two, that is the benefit administration and support. Um, under this program, SASA managed to achieve 72% of its planned targets and related to this MDP priority for this quarter. Linking the achievement of targets to these priorities, SASA performed as follows, reducing income poverty by providing social 
assistance to eligible uh, individuals. Empowered, resilient individuals, families, and sustainable communities. The overall deputy speaker of this agency, uh, we know that SASA is an entity of the Department of DSD, which has a critical role to play towards the achievement of government priorities indicated above. Let me go straight to NTA uh, 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 Deputy Speaker. I will also go to that the National NTA has a two-fold legislative mandate consisting of a primary mandate and a Honourable secondary mandate. It doesn't help to ignore it. Just switch it off. <laughs> Okay, Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry for that. Thank you. Uh, as I have said, that it's it's only twofold legislative mandate consisting of a primary and secondary. I will also go to overall financial performance and non-financial performance for the third quarter. Uh, being a scheduled GA entity as defined by Public Finance Management Act. Number one, NDA is driven principally by government grants. The budget of NDA is made up of transfer from DSD, as I have so already said, to the value of 224 million, that is 95%. And you get that it has got an interest of 2,3 million, that is 0%. The NDA did not receive any additional funding from DSD during the supplementary budget allocation to deal uh, with the impact of COVID-19. It however reprioritized on its budget allocation and allocated 95 million for COVID-19 related responses. When taking the 95 million into consideration, the budget of the NDA was three. 25 million comma nine. Now, program performance. The budget of NDA is spent amongst three programs. Uh, those programs are governance and administration. Program two, it's civil society organization. Program three, it's research, which focuses on action research and in that evaluation studies. Now let's get into program one, Deputy Speaker. Program one spends fifty seven percent of its full year. Honorable budget. member, Honorable uh, member you can't go to program one. Your time has expired. <laughs> I thought you were okay. concluding. No, please have a watch next to you. <laughs> Okay, so, thank you, Jefferson. Let me just yeah. go to the general overview. The committee noted that the report format has oh, yes. oh. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Anna. No. Deputy no. Speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, honorable members, the chairperson was introducing the report. We will now recognize political parties wishing to make a declaration. Uh, the usual times for declaration of votes will apply. The DA. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. The third quarter report of SASA and NDA's performance and expenditure has been overtaken by circumstances, with the fourth quarter having been presented to the committee, thereby updating what may have been matters to be raised in this declaration. To contextualize the concerns I'm about to raise, I would like to quote the AGSA at a meeting with the Portfolio Committee recently. Open quote, as these entities have been able to achieve clean audit outcomes, it is important that they focus on ensuring that this also translates into service delivery to citizens. In recognition of the hard work the department and its entities have done in this regard, congratulations are due. 
but that is where the good news ends. On the ground, where it all matters, and where citizens are waiting for service delivery, things don't look good at all. As one who should answer members of the public's questions, I need to raise the following issues. Let's take the cash send option for the SRD grant, on which many grant applicants depend as they don't have bank accounts that would keep incurring bank charges while they wait endlessly for the grants to be paid into them. Sasa confirmed at the recent meeting that although this payment option was marketed as one option, SRD grants could use to recipients could use to receive their emergency SRD grant, it is still not operational due to delays in negotiations with the banks. Let us turn to the Sasa call center. The SRD grant is processed online and no services are provided or inquiries entertained at local Sasa offices. Application, applicants are advised to use media channels or to phone Sasa. Not one of these contact platforms are functional. This leads to applicants giving up applying for the money they so desperately need to stay alive with their families even before they start. Tragically, and based on the direct communications I have received, SESA grant beneficiaries are still subjected to fraudulent withdrawals, particularly the elderly. Unsuspecting old age grant recipients have their pins changed and their money withdrawn at areas far from their homes, often for other people in other provinces. How can they provide for their food, for their chronic medication and any other needs they depend on this money for? Again, SASA is having serious discussions with the post office on this issue, while beneficiaries are inconvenienced at best or left to starve at worst. It, is, it gets worse, Chair, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. The post offices often do not have sufficient money when grant approval and money transfer SMSs have been sent to applicants. Desperate, desperate recipients travel long distances to collect their grant, confident that they will receive their money when they arrive at the post office, having received a confirmation SMS. But on arrival, they are told the post office does not have money and they are forced to travel. They are forced to travel back home empty-handed. The problem deepens when they have to borrow money to come back the following day to start again. By this time, they get, by the time they get the money, if they do at all, they have to refund all the borrowed transport money, leaving them little to survive on. The money announced by the Honorable President has never reached the intended recipients months after it was announced. While the audit looks good, we cannot celebrate while poor people starve. In light of these very serious and damning lapses in implementation, one can only reflect. Honorable Minister, the presentation of the AGSA put an ember label on the effective leadership of SASA at a miserable 33%. You need to step up. Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker, there is no time on, on this uh, declaration uh, for very critical issues that are long overdue. Investigations taking years to finalize while millions of rands have been wasted. The filling of key positions can be directly blamed for lapses in administration of SASA grants and this also was cited by the AGSA as compromising the effective execution of their mandate, thus compromising the delivery of services to the poor and vulnerable citizens. Please stop their suffering, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member, EFF. Um, Deputy Speaker, the country's false perception about us being a united nation was thrown asunder by the COVID pandemic, which laid bare the death of poverty and suffering of the majority of our people. At the greatest moment of need from our people, the South African Social Security Agency desperately failed to ensure that the most vulnerable were treated with dignity and respect. 
the six million people who were recipients of the COVID special relief grant had to stand in inhuman queues for hours and sometimes were turned back at the post office where their funds were not disbursed. To date, there are still people who were approved for the special relief grant who have never received these monies. It is an indictment on the department that you played with emotions of desperate and hungry black people. The response to and the desperation shown by South Africans in the relation to the special relief grants is the clearest indicator that we are a country that has ignored the poorest of the poor. The inability to create sustainable jobs means that more and more of our people will be languishing in poverty for a very long time. Now is the time for the state to consider a universal employment grant in the country. The Minister of Social Development indicated that this will be a consideration and this since gone silent on the matter. And we guess it is because of the bullying of the National Treasury, which has taken a patently anti-poor posture in recent times. And therefore, as the EFF, we reject this report. Thank you. Thank you, IFP. Thank you, Afghara Deputy Speaker. Um, we are asked today the matters of two entities, SASA and the NDA. Both these entities are tasked with looking after the most vulnerable citizens in our society. When we hold them to account, we are doing so on behalf of South Africa's vulnerable children, the elderly, those with disabilities, and all those who face the daily onslaught of hunger and poverty. Much has happened since this report was tabled, Deputy, Deputy Speaker. The IFP must therefore qualify our views on this report. Firstly, we cannot ignore the fact that social ills continue to deepen this year. According to this report, the NDA was only able to targets for the third quarter. The NDA's core mandate is to support civil society organizations. Yet at a time when civil society organizations are desperate for a little bit of government help to provide vital su support and services to our communities, the NDA failed to meet more than a third of its targets. SASA, which provides the thin buffer between starvation and survival for many South African families, also didn't meet a third of its targets. There are also still ongoing concerns with SASA, such as fraudulent deductions, people sleeping at SASA offices for days on end, and a non-functional call center. Many South Africans were rejected from the 350 Rand grant for no apparent reason, while many are still waiting to get paid. Moreover, yet again, SASA is unable to explain the delay in collecting 6 million Rand in debt. But we must face the facts, Deputy Speaker. The debt owed to SASA is only going to balloon because SASA systems are broken. So ineffective and outdated are their databases that many government officials and even company CEOs have been able to collect the 350 Rand grant unlawfully. And not a single cent honorable members have been recovered from any of these fraudsters. In a recent written reply to my question and to the DA, it was revealed that more than 177,000 government officials were collecting a social grant of some sort. Over 200 million is being paid in grants to government officials this month. These social grants have now been suspended. But my question is, why did it take a parliamentary question for the Minister of Social Development to realize that she might be paying government officials grants for which they do not qualify for? How many more people are collecting grants unlawfully? But more importantly, how is SASA going to recover this debt? And how is it possible that while our communities face a daily war against poverty, we have government employees collecting grants meant for the poorest of the poor? Where is this so-called caring government when our vulnerable citizens need them? The IFP supports this committee report, Chairperson, but we want the Department of Social Development to start holding to account government officials who fail our people. SASA systems are routinely being abused by slippery, greedy government officials filling their pockets, while the real issues, gender-based violence, gangsterism, substance abuse, 
Thank you, Denise. Um, Our people please. deserve it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Uh, no, 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 no. Members, I, this is the third, fourth, fifth appeal over a long period of time. To keep to your time. Please do that. We hope we, we will introduce a system here that will automatically shut you off completely so that none of us have to waste our air time on you because you have exceeded your time. Uh, FF Plus. Thank you, Akbarat, young speaker. The National Development Agency has marginally improved when looking at spending. It is, however, still unacceptable that at the end of the third quarter spending of a budget is only at 51%. And the Criminal Assets Recovery Account, CARA, is even worse at 26% spending. The 63% overall achievement rate is also nothing to get excited about. The only target that has been achieved was to source goods and services from triple BE com companies. But even that target has a, but wait, there's more disclaimer. An entity with a mandate to eradicate poverty and its causes by granting funds to civil society organizations and to promote consultation, dialogue, and sharing of development experiences between CSOs and the state, but only pays out 12 of the 75 million rand target towards CSOs is not an entity that is doing their jobs. The NDA needs to pull up their socks. Then turning to Sasa, let me start out by saying that I would like to thank the senior managers and staff at head office that deal with grant problems, which I and my colleagues report to them regularly. My wish is that all Sasa staff, especially those at grant level, can be as efficient and helpful. Also, to a call center agent in Pumalanga called Kasper, when no other call center lines were answered, you answered and assisted. An overall achievement rate of 74% is better than the 39 and 71% achievements during quarter one and two respectively, but it's still not ideal, especially taking into account the hardships faced during this pandemic and the amount of people reliant on SASA. Furthermore, the prolonged delays for the payment of SRD grants and ECD stimulus packages is a matter of concern. ECDs are extremely important for the development of our youth. Having ECDs not supported and monies delayed directly affects South Africa's future. The SRD grant has been problematic since its inception 19 months ago, and my colleagues have all addressed that. The delays of payments, the issues with the payment system having to be reactivated, appeals taking forever to be settled, people having applied at the start of the process, not having received a cent to date, despondent South Africans not even applying after reopening. We have truly let our most vulnerable down. Ma Akhbarat, young speaker, I want to conclude by quoting the Helen Suzman Foundation. No doubt, the SRD grant has reduced anger. But the questions are, by how much, with what efficiency, and can legitimate demand for SRD grants increase well beyond the number of grants made in the first 12 months of experience with it? The analysis indicates that there are grounds for serious concern about all these answers to these three questions. Akhbarat, young speaker, Akhdanki. Akhdanki, on time. ACDP. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the report on the entities of the Department of Social Development comes as the reality of a deepening social crisis is becoming more clearer by the day. The reality is that when morning breaks for most South Africans, the darkness, the darkness does not disappear, disappear. It brings home the stark reality of having very little protection against violence, hunger, and severe levels of poverty. I will focus on the broad strokes that this report comes under. We have reported cases of child rape that was reported to our constituency officers and an increase in child pregnancies reported by communities. This brings home the reality that there exists very little protection against violence, hunger and severe levels of poverty for women and children. The breakdown of the family unit affects women and children the most and right now 
we are struggling to accommodate women, to find accommodation for women with children faced with evictions or that are in the process of being evicted. It is my experience of the services of the department and its entities that it is sluggish, fragmented in approach, protective of its own mistakes, with a lack of integration between departments with a shared mandate. I will have to add that there are moments of heartwarming brilliance, especially in the children's sector and where it concerns children, but it is moments far and, far and few between. Deferred hope makes the heart sick. We are out of time in presenting timeliest <coughs> solutions and interventions that will reduce the mental trauma and provide the needed social support to those who need it the most. It is impossible, Deputy Speaker, for this department and its entities to respond to the escalating crises we witness around us. And we have to divorce ourselves of the notion that there is such a thing as a capable state able to respond to the ever-deepening crises before us. It is impossible. The ACDP believes that the model for building capable communities is the answer. We need to move beyond the incapable and capable state and create capable communities. We are at the point where we with urgency need to close a strong loop to ensure the delivery of essential and critical services happens within our communities. The ACDP has called for greater oversight over the department because we fail to see the impact of the NDA in a real and sustainable terms that will ensure the execution of its mandate in light of the underspending on its core program. It is in light of this that we reiterate again that, the, that oversight needs to be strengthened over this department and particularly on the NDA. I thank you. But thank you just on time. Just on time. UDM. ATM is not here. Good. Good. Not good. NFP. Thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker, for your humor in this matter. Deputy uh, Speaker. Sheikh Imam, when, yes, you put up, when you put up your speech in front of you, we can't see you. You can't see me? Then, no, not with a paper in front of you. <laughs> we that can't. Paper, sir. There's no paper. Okay. Let Thank me, you. Let me, let me also explain to you the reason, the other reason. I always talk about disability inclusion. There are people <laughs> who want to lips. So don't hide yourself. People want to see you and read your lips uh, because otherwise, what's the point of having that video unless you ask to be switched off? In which case, that would be okay. Because that. Thank you very much for that. Go Thank ahead, you Nathan. Your... Thank you for your wisdom and guidance, Deputy Speaker. It looks like your international visit has done a lot of good. But thank you very much for that. Uh, Deputy Speaker, allow me first of all, ask me first of all to advise the National Department of Social Development that with the high unemployment rate in the country, with the fourth wave that is anticipated in December, it can only get progressively worse. And that is the socioeconomic conditions under which our people live. So what I'm pleading with in starters for the department is to up its game. And I know that they find it, they find themselves in a very difficult situation. They did not expect the impact of COVID, which impacted on their department, because they had to, in a very short space of time, put in some measures to deal with these things. But let me also welcome the new initiative, something that we've been very vocal about in the South. And let me commend the minister for and that is the number of social worker graduates in the country who have been unemployed. And now the department is talking about employing them and deploying them on the ground, which will go a long way in dealing with the issues of gender-based violence and things, rather than waiting for people to be murdered and raped and grandstanding, yeah, you're going to put in these measures 
to prevent these things from happening. So congratulations, Minister, for you and your team on that new initiative, which I think was long overdue. Now, the issue of social grants is a problem. Many people are not able to get through you know, call centers and things, and they don't have the luxury of data or airtime to be able to do that. So you need to deal with that, particularly the post offices. And you know the post office is bankrupt right now. It's technically insolvent, calling for a bailout. The medium-term budget policy statement has not provided for any bailout for them. So whether they're going to survive or not, I don't know. Again, it means, Minister, in your team, you're going to have to look at other ways of providing this uh, SDA grant to our people on the ground. Added to that, I want to tell you, this 350 grant, RAND grant does not solve the problem, even though it goes a long way in assisting our people. Because our businesses have upped their prices by 40 and 50 percent. The 350 RAND is not worth 100 RAND today. So I want to plead with the department, we support this report. We support your new initiative in putting more social workers on the ground. Let's hope that will yield us out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Under time. Thank you very much. AIC. Not here. Cope. Not coping. PAC. Not here. Al Jama. Hanif Hendricks, where are you, sir? <laughs> Absent without leave. <laughs> uh, uh, Honorable Sheikh Imam, just switch off your, your, your mic, uh, uh, please. ANC. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, the African National Congress has placed the theory of a developmental state as a key policy uh, frame in building a state which has got the cap cap capability to respond to the social and economic needs of our people. It is for this reason that the African National Congress has advanced an activist parliament which emphasizes the centrality of the people and their challenges as a core focus of our parliamentary work. The South African Social Security Agency, SASA, plays a critical role in ensuring that social grants are distributed effectively and efficiently. The mandate of SASA is critical in reducing poverty and the high levels of income and as well as inequality. Uh, a critical indicator to assess the administrative capacity of this entity is the pace it takes to process the applications as it relates to the different grants, whether it's SRD grants, or any other social relief grants. It is commendable, Honorable Deputy Speaker, to note that SASA managed to achieve 94.2% uh, over a non-funded and 25% of the target of processing new grants application within 10 days. Contrary to the expectations from the opposition benches on the capability of the state to upscale disbursement into a short period of time, SASA has risen to the occasion amidst the limitations imposed by the COVID-19 conditions. The National Development Agency also plays a critical role in eradicating poverty through granting funds for civil society organizations for various social objectives and, and, and through social dialogue and mobilization for progressive movement and development as well. The NDA did not receive any additional funding from the DSD during the supplementary budget allocations to deal with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. It has, a, as it has, however, reprioritized its budget allocations and allocated about 95 million for COVID-19 uh, related responses. The ANC uh, supports this report and welcomes the improved performance from SASA as well as NDA amidst the challenges that they are facing imposed uh, on the two entities by uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Deputy Speaker, building a capable and ethical developmental state required continued enhancement of systems and the capability of a department to deliver its mandate efficiently. The two entities have demonstrated uh, positive improvements and therefore they need to be applauded for the efforts that they have actually undertaken. As the ANC, we fully support uh, this report. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Chief Whip, uh, Deputy Chief Whip. Uh, Thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker. I move that the report be adopted. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? Yes, Honorable Member. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Please note the objection of the EFF. Okay, EFF's objection will be noted. Any other? None. The report is therefore agreed to uh, with the recognition of the objections. Uh, the secretary will read the second order. Consideration of report of portfolio committee on transport on oversight visit to Gauteng and Pumalanga provinces. Uh, the Honorable MJ Zwani will introduce the report. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. My name is Lisa Mangu. I will introduce the report on behalf of the chairperson. Oh, okay. Let's say that I was misled or, or some mistake happened here. What's written here is what? <laughs> Not much. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Honorable members of the August House, members of the Portfolio Committee from all the political parties. The Portfolio Committee on Transport is presenting before the National Assembly the report of the Portfolio Committee on Transport on an oversight visit to the Gauteng and Pumalanga provinces for consideration. The visit by the Portfolio Committee to the two provinces occurred during 26 to 28 November 2020, the report was approved by the Portfolio Committee subsequently. The purpose of the visit was to establish the progress made by the Department of Transport to date at the time regarding the Moloto Corridor Project with emphasis on the rail component of the project, ensuring improvement of the road and rail infrastructure in a critical priority for efficient movement of goods and people thereby contributing to the economic development in the country and the region in particular. <clears throat> the focus of the oversight was to meet the respective stakeholders and to understand the current budget spent on the project. The committee also sought to interact with many stakeholders, Sandral, Prasa, amongst others. Furthermore, the information on the project was also sought from the Department of Transport in relation to the budget for the project and the outcomes of feasibility studies, as well as the MOU signed with the China Communication Construction Company. The committee further focused on the second leg, um, on Prasa's ability to execute its mandate. Prasa was negatively affected by the national lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Moloto Rail project was conceptualized to reduce road fatalities as these were rather high, as it was the only means of transport for people in the area. The project was also conceptualized to increase economic activity in the area, which is a key priority of government. The committee visited His Majesty King Makosonge II's cluster in the Tembisilehani local municipality to seek to hear from him firsthand what the position of the kingdom is regarding this project. The report raises a number of observations. The community raised their frustration with government not implementing the project as was initially indicated to the people of Kwamhlanga. Community representatives frustratingly reflected on the high loss of life on the Moloto Road as some 40 people per month lose their lives on that road. The community was concerned with the lack of development in the area which can lead to economic development and job creation. Community leaders and representatives uh, sought in our interaction the development of the project to reduce the loss of lives on the Moloto Road and also seek economic development 
and job creation in the area. In Gauteng, the committee visited a couple of stations on the Mamelodi side of the corridor, Kudusport, situated at Kilna Park, Tswane and Mamelodi Gardens, train stations, and it also met with Prasa at its head offices. Lastly, Chairperson, rail development has been announced on this area of Kwamhlanga, Moloto Road, and requires to be implemented to the benefit of the people. And as a committee, we are unwavering in calling on the department and government to make sure that this project is implemented. The portfolio committee will resolutely continue with the work in conjunction with the key stakeholders and implement the recommendations of the report. The portfolio committee approved the report and submits this, this report for the consideration of the National Assembly. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Manu. There's been a House request. Chair. Is this? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I will now recognize the parties that wish to make a declaration. The DA. Uh, the Pumalanga visit. <coughs> Honorable House Chairperson, just before we start, I want to acknowledge the Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Transport, Honorable Mangete, for his recognition of traditional leadership, in that when I approached him about the need to go to the traditional leaders and brief them first about our visit in the province of Mpumalanga, he was amenable and, in fact, even went far and beyond the call of duty and ensured that he played a pivotal role in the, in the preparations to meet His Majesty, the King of Amandebele, King Makosonke II, as well as the late chairperson of the Nzunza Traditional Council, His Royal Highness Yukusi Ubaba Wandri Sumbangwa Mashango. May his, role, may his soul rest in peace. Honorable House Chairperson, firstly, the people of Kumalanga are dying, and they continue to die, and the current government has no care in the world to stop the bloodbath. I say this with conviction because the actions of the ANC government dictate so. Since the oversight visit in the province of Kumalanga last year, six people have been beyond recognition when a bus they were traveling in caught fire on the notorious death trap that is Moloto Road, R573. This happened on the 21st of May, 2021. Since then, another two people were killed and 26 people sustained serious injuries on the 22nd of October, 2021. Most recently, just last week, Friday, another horrific accident involving a bus, a truck, and three light commercial vehicles on the same road stretch, Moloto R573. Uh, Honorable House Chairperson, the Portfolio Committee on Transport through the Chairperson of Seven Zizwane promised the people of Malanga that the committee will come back and provide a detailed report back with regards to the Moloto Railway Corridor. The Portfolio Committee was scheduled to go to Malanga at the end of March 2021, but the Portfolio Committee on Transport postponed the report back session. When the TA proposed that the Portfolio Committee should go to Mpumalanga in the month of June, the ANC flatly refused and provided a lousy reason that all oversight uh, visits during recess were banned by the House Chairperson, Cedric Florid, and even provided an email correspondence to this effect. Just this past Tuesday, in the Portfolio Committee on Transport, the ANC further rejected that another opportunity for the Portfolio Committee to go on a scheduled visit in Mpumalanga next month in December. Honorable House Chairperson, I ask, how many people must die in Mpumalanga before the ANC implements the Moloto Railway Corridor? On the Houghton uh, component of the visit, for this component, we visited the Greater Jamestown Taxi Rank, Paraguana Taxi Rank, Bree Taxi Rank, and MTN Taxi Rank. Needless to say, what we discovered was disheartening and harrowing. It was horrific, to say the least, the inhumane conditions at, at those taxi ranks leaves very little to be desired. The situation is dying very desperate on a wide range of challenges. Most of the challenges are listed below. For instance, in the greater, John, in the greater Jamestown taxi rank, there were no functional toilets that we got there. There was no running water. There were no facilities to wash hands. The, the, faci the facilities generally were very filthy, and a small water tank was supplied, but was never really used. And then also, 
The, the Department of Transport claimed that they provided masks, but they never provided anything. Um, again, the same situation in, in the Baraguanath uh, taxi ring. Here, it is a very sad moment. On the 11th of May 2020, there was a PR exercise which was undertaken by the uh, Minister of Transport, Gauteng MEC for Transport, and the late city of Johannesburg, Mayor Jeff Makubo. A, a sanitation booth was put up at the Baraguanath uh, taxi ramp. And just for that visit, for the commuters to use it. As soon as that visit was done and completed, and all these uh, politicians who want to become celebrities were done going through that uh, sanitation booth, it was taken exactly less than an hour after the media had left that facility. What does that say? It says the ANC government does not care at all about the well-being of the people, but they are more concerned about the media hits and, and PR exercises, which, that, which do little to serve the people that they claim that they, that they represent. And this happens because an ANC government still does not care about saving the people. They only care about corruption and stealing money and making sure that they continue to let the people of Pumalanga to die. And I ask this question again and I say, how many more people in Pumalanga must die before you implement the Muloto Railway Corridor? And the blood of those people is in the hands of the ANC. I thank you. Thank you, EFF. Thank you, House Chair. Uh, let me state up front that uh, Honorable Makosini was supposed to be doing this declaration, but he had an accident this morning and uh, he's in hospital, so I'll be doing it. I'll be doing both declarations on his behalf. Thank you. The EFF formed part of the team that went to do oversight in Gauteng and in Pumalanga. The findings in Gauteng and in Pumalanga were no different from that of free state. The state of transport and infrastructure in this country is shameful. For instance, Prasa has completely collapsed and the minister is only concerned with being a Twitter celebrity instead of ensuring that the roads are fixed, the trains are working, and the perennial problems of taxi violence are sorted out. We accept the report because we were there and saw for ourselves the devastating impacts of years of neglect of transport infrastructure by the Transport Ministry. Thank you. Thank you. We proceed to the IFP. IFP, thank you, Not Honorable House Chair. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Uh, I will speak on behalf of Honorable uh, Sitoli. He's having a network problem. Proceed, ma. I don't worry. Okay. Proceed. Don't worry about the noise. It's just that you, we can't see your face. You're, there's something. Yeah, it's covering. Okay, Let me move to a, a better position. Uh, you can just switch off the, 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 the video and speak, my dear. Can you see my face now? Yes, now, now we see Miss. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Honorable House Chair. This report regarding the committee's oversight tour to the provinces of Gauteng and Bumalanga in specific the Moloto Rail Corridor project has a clear example of this government failure to our people. In a recent article, it was discovered that Transnet Rail Network could help ease the burden of 58 million tons of cargo from our roads. This highlights the huge potential for alternative means of transport with lower running costs. Given the recent fuel increase that government has passed onto our citizens, it also means that there could be far less fatalities on our roads. The Molotov Rail Corridor project has been a burning issue for the local people 
for about 14 years. Local communities have been pleading with government to implement this rail project. The, as the road is overburdened and it is estimated that almost 500 people lose their lives on the road alone per annum. Furthermore, the devastating caused by the loss of lives leaves a lasting social problem in creating child-headed families. Yet this department simply does not care about the precious lives of South Africans. This committee heard that the department had provided false timeline for, for councillors to report at the local community in a devious stalling tactic to keep the community quiet, all while lives were being lost. The ANC-led government takes pleasure in grandstanding in this house and tells us how wonderful their work is. Yet here is the evidence found by the committee that their, their promises are lies. The former president, Mr. Jacob Zuma, in his SONA address promised that this project would be implemented in the year 2006 and 2007 financial year. However, upon conducting the oversight, the committee hears that this has become a blame game on the part of the department and entities. They are clueless as to how to go about implementing infrastructure pro uh, projects. This department is currently experiencing its own state of disaster. This project is also quite concerning as it has been handed off to the China communication construction company to build a rail corridor. Why has government not found the necessary skills in our local industries to support this project? In 14 years, why has government not developed the needed skills and capacity within our country for local businesses to benefit from. The IFP supports the committee's recommendation that this department must submit a comprehensive report on the matters contained in this oversight visit within 30 days. However, this report must contain extra steps by this department to address the needs of the community with an immediate six month plan and follow up reports and the IFP supports the report. Thank you, uh, Honorable House Chair. Thank you. FF Plus? No declaration, House Chair. Thank you. ACGP? UDM? ATM? Good. NFP? NFP, hey, I'm, f I'm feeling what you are saying, but I can't. AIC, COPE, PAC, Aljama, the ANC. Thank you very much, House Chair. Good afternoon once more, honorable members, colleagues, members of the Portfolio Committee, and um, South Africans at large, good afternoon. Um, firstly, we, as the ANC, would like to extend our deepest condolences to the families of those people who have lost their lives through different crashes on the notorious road, the Muloto Road. We are saddened by what is happening and we share in the pain of those people. Secondly, the report on the second leg was mainly to Prasa and not to the taxi ranks as my colleague uh, from the Democratic Alliance could have just missed that. So I thought I would just correct that. That the second leg of this particular report was to Prasa and not to the taxi ranks. That was a totally different. Of course, the things that were raised are true and they are factual. But just that the report is not the one we are presenting here today. So from the onset, I think we need to confirm that the ANC-led government subscribes to the provision of safe, reliable, affordable, and efficient public transport available to all South Africans, including the citizens of Mpumalanga, in particular, 
the Moloto Road Corridor citizens there. And as part of its as part of its oversight responsibilities, Parliament, through the work of this committee, is committed to holding the executive authority responsible and all the SOEs accountable. Therefore, the notion that certain members of this committee care more for the people of Moloto than other members do must be rejected with the contempt it deserves. All of us are saddened and all of us in the committee have expressed our disgust at what is happening on that road. This committee will use its constitutional powers to continue to monitor that the Minister of Transport, the department, provincial departments involved in the Moloto Road Corridor, Rail and Road Corridor project are held accountable and all those that are responsible. The Portfolio Committee on Transport undertook this oversight visit as was indicated in the, in the introduction and made a couple of observations which the two previous colleagues have already highlighted and I will not uh, uh, repeat. I could not really pick up the colleague from IFP what she was saying. She was breathing heavily, you know, and I don't know what was angering her. Maybe she could have been able to... Uh, Lies by the ANC. Uh, they say the truth hurts, and it's very true. The purpose of the report, I mean of the oversight, I think uh, both my colleague Mabena and uh, my colleague Noluchungu have already uh, explained what the purpose was. But I want to add on that one of the key stakeholders we wanted to meet were the people who had organized themselves and had camped at the union buildings for a long time, uh, wanting as a means of drawing attention to the plight of the Moloto Corridor residents. We listened to them, we heard their plight, we shared their pain, and it is out of that. It is not entirely correct, but I think 90% correct, that the committee agreed to go back in March. That was said, but it was also qualified, and it is in the report, that if not at the closest possible time, that the committee will find. So we must, we must just try and not hijack the plight of the people of Moloto and grandstand and try and seem to be holy at thou. The pain there is too big and we need to pull hands together and address it. The committee on its second leg uh, went to uh, visit Prasa, as we already said, and these stations are in Gauteng, particularly in Tswane. The committee visited the Pinar Sport Corridor, which includes Kudu Sport train station, Mamelodi Gardens station, and we had an opportunity to interact with commuters who were standing in lists. And the report and the feedback we got was not very encouraging. We call on the Minister of Transport and the Board of Prasa to reinstate as speedily as possible the train services that our people need mostly and to make sure that security is improved. In our interaction with the board, which was newly appointed at the time, it was clear to us as the portfolio committee that the destruction of infrastructure during hard lockdown due to poor or lack of security there was still no convincing plan to turn around the situation. The committee also urges the minister through the board to ensure security is addressed and we will continue to ensure that we hold them accountable. Lastly, House Chairperson, the committee resolved to meet National Treasury, which we have since done, to understand for ourselves the financial implications or not of the Moloto Road uh, Rail, rather not Road Corridor. We therefore thank the committee members for their positive contribution in the deliberations in the committee and in the oversight, and particularly today. And the ANC supports 
this report on oversight visit to Mpumalanga and Gauteng. Thank you, House Chairperson. Thank you, Babamangu. I will now recognize the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Chairperson, I move that the report be adopted. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. Mama um, Josie and everyone else on the virtual platform, in Rayen's Lego Lego, I carry Sinagan. When a person speaks, you don't respond because you get your opportunity to speak. Leave the mics. As uh, Kubegeni, the third order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Transport on Oversight Visit to Mpumalanga Metropolitan Municipality. Thank you very much. Hey, Bob Mang. Manga Wung Metropolitan Municipality. Sorry. Bob Mang, it's cutting a sack. Siabonga Slalo Wendlu. On behalf of the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Zwane, it's my honor and privilege to present to the House the report on the Portfolio Committee on Transport and an oversight visit to Mangaung Metropolitan Municipality. Mangaung Metropolitan Municipality, the visit occurred on the 13th, 14th, and November 2020. And the report being introduced to the National Assembly was adopted by the Portfolio Committee on Transport. The purpose of the oversight visit was to gain an understanding of the progress made to date on the implementation of the integrated public transport network in the metro and more specifically the bus rapid transit commonly known as the BRT. Infrastructure projects component of the IPTN for the metro Furthermore, the committee sought insight into the budget allocation versus budget spending. The committee also visited the Lingau Licensing and Testing Center in the Metro to understand the challenges internally experienced at the center and from the public that have complained of limitations to access services of obtaining driving, license, driving licenses. The site visit to Bloemfontein Omangaung License Testing Center occurred on the 13th and commenced with a meeting with officials from the respective departments. The purpose of the meeting was to receive a briefing on the functioning of the licensing testing center, which was critical in the assessment of the center. There were a number of challenges that the committee observed at the licensing testing center which were highlighted to the committee and the same time remedial action were also proposed and, uh, for implementation. The challenges amongst them include the availability or the non-availability thereof of what is called the e-native system, debt due to unpaid motor license fees, the country has to develop a culture of payment for services, we noted. A new debt management system is being implemented to show a culture or ensure a culture of compliance. There was also the closure of some DLTCs uh, due to COVID-19. The report also points or seeks to point at combating of corruption at the center as seven officials, administrative clerks had been charged by the Hawks for fraud, corruption, and money laundering at the center. This is a very critical part of ensuring that service delivery occurs in the sector. The visit to the licensing and testing center was part of establishing a culture of striving for efficiency, constant improvement and innovation to improve service delivery to the monitoring of public and in particular the public in general. In terms of the IPTN, the committee visited the bus depot, the construction site, which is part of phase one infrastructure project for the metro 
or the IPTN. Thereafter, the committee visited the Metro's depot where we were exposed to some buses which unfortunately had not been used for a long time. Amongst other municipal fleets at the depot, we saw the 10 coaches or buses that were purchased in 2019, and these buses had been stationary for about a period of a year. This is a source of concern for the committee. A debriefing was held with the committee on the 14th November to explain some of the issues. The report before the House presents or makes a couple of observations and recommendations which have been analyzed and implemented to ensure th that the transport sector is being attended to the public transport. House Chairperson, honorable members, once more, we present this report to the National Assembly for consideration and that we will make sure that we hold the Mangaung Metropolitan Municipality accountable once this report is approved and its recommendations. I thank you, House Chairperson. Thank you, Babu Manu. Uh, in number, I want to in the house. It's low, and it temperature nayo. In jalo, I see a favorite. The the it can be the same as when we are two hundred. No, no, uh, We proceed. There's been a request for declarations. The DA. Uh, um, House Chair, um, allow me to start off by thanking the Democratic Alliance Councillor in the Mangaung Metro Municipality and Ward uh, 47 Councillor Mukhadi Khanaka for your continued oversight in the Mangaung Metropolitan's Integrated Public Transport Network, that is the IPTN. On the 13th and 14th of November 2020, the Portfolio Committee on Transport undertook the oversight visit to Mangaung Metropolitan's uh, Lengaung Drivers Testing Center, as uh, Mr. Mangu has indicated, including the Integrated Public Transport Network Project, otherwise known as the Haoweng Bus Service. While I recognize and appreciate the visit to, Linga, uh, to Lengaung uh, Learners Testing Center, I've chosen to specifically focus on the Integrated Public Transport Network in the Mangaung Metro. I trust that my colleague there, Honorable uh, Karabo Kakao, will deal with all the Lena testing centers in the Free State. In 2019, I stood before this house and I made it abundantly clear that the Democratic Alliance regards public transport as one of the most important reform essentials. However, to the ANC-run Mangaung Metro, public transport is seemingly an opportunity to dispense patronage, continue with failed cater deployment, and enrich politically connected companies, never mind the number of people who were in acting positions there. When the Portfolio Committee undertook the oversight to the IPTN on the Friday of the 13th of November 2020, the project was estimated to be at 40% completion. The then city manager and the head of the IPTN, Mr. Rapuhuana, made a commitment to the committee that the first IPTN route will be launched by March 2021. It is now November 2021, and I can confirm that not a single IPTN bus route has been launched by the Mangaung Metro. The construction of the IPTN bus depot in terms of phase one, which includes the civic works, was due to be completed between February and March of 2021. This too has not been materialized. And in fact, based on the last meeting that was held, the new date for the phase one completion is now March and April 2022. While these completions and broken promises are synonymous with ANC-run municipalities, what irks me the most is the amount of money that has been spent on the project thus far, particularly as it relates to the leasing and or purchase of the buses. Maung Metro has leased or purchased 10 buses, each costing 5.5 million rand, and that is a total of 55 million rands. It was also indicated that the National Department of Transport approved the leasing and or purchase of these buses. Asked why so much money per bus, the answer was that there were modifications and or features that were added to the buses, such as the GPS, and making the bus uh, wheelchair friendly. However, for the life of me, the closest that I could get in my research, given the said modifications, was a mere 2.5 million rands. 
We learned during the continued oversight that, in fact, a third party had facilitated the lease contract with Standard Bank. Motebe Wheels had facilitated the contract on behalf of the Metro as a middleman, which earned him a whopping 11 million rands, honorable members. None of the questions asked regarding the leasing and the purchasing of these buses were responded to by Mangaung Metro. Honorable House Chair, in, 2000, uh, in June 2021, the Auditor General of South Africa noted that since 2016, Mangaung Metro has spent well over 705 million rand on the IPTN planning and feasibility studies. The bulk of this money going to two companies, namely Glad Africa and LTE. House Chairperson, while issues of concern and challenges regarding the Mangaung IPTN are plenty, what I cannot shy away from is that millions of hard-earned taxpayers' money continues to be poured down the drain by metro municipalities, by the metro municipality, clearly which cannot get things done on behalf of its people. Why Mangawung and Rustenburg in particular cannot use Go George as a benchmark is beyond me. The National Department of Transport must make a commitment to the people of Mangawung and South Africans at large that they will withhold whatever funding to the Mangawung Metro's IPTN project until such time that a properly constituted monitoring and evaluation plan is presented both to the department as well as the portfolio committee. South Africans can no longer afford to have their hard-earned money go down the drain and make and create instant millionaires. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hausie. When we went to Mangawung, we were met with shock to note that the buses that had been bought for millions since the launch of the bus rapid transport system were not being utilized and were gathering dust. For years, the Free State Government had been turned into a cash cow for corruption, and those who were close to political leaders were milking the province dry. Upon us asking what caused the delay on this project, because it had been funded and was supposed to be launched, we were merely told that a second batch of buses had subsequently been bought to pile on the number of buses that were gathering dust. The bus system in the free state is a completely failed project, and this is despite the dire need for a working public transport network in that province. There are a number of public transport challenges in Bloemfontein, including deteriorating roads and the narrow roads infrastructure that has not been upgraded as corruption has taken over. We, however, support this report and its recommendations because we were part of that oversight and we witnessed what was happening in Mangawong. Thank you. IFP. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The, overs the oversight visit to Mangawong municipality has advanced a long standing trend within the Department of Mara Administration and Lack of Planning. During the committee visit to area of on the 13th of November 2020, we uncover several issues within the licensing and testing center. Reforms are needed to automate the renewal of license and booking so that there is a reduced reliance of need for physical attendance of this center. Using the more automated system would be a smooth flow of clients being assisted each day and reduce the, the time people lost have to spend in long queues and taking time away from work. The need to automate a large portion of the licensing system is well established. However, there is a common trend in government departments, entities and services offices where the equipment is not properly managed and maintained. In this particular station, several officials have been charged with fraud, corruption, and money laundering. 
why we congratulate the SIU in this regard. We must equally stress the importance of bringing those in position of authority, the high level and officials and management to book for similar crimes. The integrated public transport network in Mangawung has shown this 